but generally, oops, got it. Um, but generally, I'm referring to the same thing. Now, first, I'm going to address how important rebuttals is or how important responses are um, in a debate speech. Now, some people often prioritize the argumentative part of their debate, meaning you have your arguments, the things that you've discussed in prep, and you always think of how to refine it, how to get better at this. But what distincts a debate from, say, a public speech or just talking on your own is the fact that you have to go against another team directly, right? You have to go against another speaker directly. And that is why responses is very important in debating. A lot of people think like, oh, we were the best speakers. Why didn't we win, win that argument? Why we didn't we win that speech? And more likely than not, it's because you didn't engage with the other team. So what do we mean by engage? Engage means to listen to what they have to say, acknowledge what they say, and respond appropriately. Right, so you can listen, but you sometimes a lot of people listen like, oh, they said this, oh, that doesn't make sense. And then, yep, I'm done with my responses and then they move on to your argumentation. That's not really a response and that's not really engaging because you're not giving your opposition the credit that they deserve because obviously their argumentations have basis, their argumentations make sense. So as a good sportsman debater, you must engage and you must give credit where it's due. And that's why responses are very important. To visualize, that's in terms of how the debate goes. But to visualize, another reason why rebuttals are important is because let's say this is you on government. This is the bar opposition. You give your argumentation and it's this good. So opposition hasn't said anything. So when only government has spoken, obviously government wins. Then suddenly opposition comes and they gave their argument. And the argument is so close to being as good as government, but not really. Coupled with the fact that they didn't respond, it's easier for opposition to lose. But if opposition comes up and responds to government, they destroy Allah. They destroy some of government's responses, or some of our government's argumentation, sorry. And which means that it gives opposition a better ability to win the debate, or it gives them a lower barrier to winning, basically. So responses are very important. All right, so enough of why it's important. Obviously, it's important. Um, the question is, how do we respond, right? And that's particularly what we're going to learn today. So how do we respond? Um, there are a lot of methods to responding, but I'm not gonna call it methods. I'm gonna call it layers because they often complement each other or they're often deployed, or like the second uh, like way of responding is often deployed only when, um, how do I say this? Only when the first one doesn't function. I'll, I'll explain it a little bit more later. But there are layers to responding. Meaning, let's say this is a whole argumentation, remember on Gov just now. If you respond one part, you can, you can probably kill this one off. But you have to go further. You have to respond to this part. You have to go further, respond to C as well. And if you deploy or deploy all of them really well, then you basically ruin the whole argumentation. Coupled with the fact that not only do you diminish their argument, you try to build your part as well. This is like the ultimate, ultimate response, but I'll, I'll explain it a little bit more later, right? But that's the visual of what it looks like. So how, what exactly are these layers? Can someone tell me when building an argumentation, what are some of the elements of an argument? If you guys went to the argument lecture la, the other day, can someone tell me what are the elements of an argument? To everyone that just got here, we're basically talking about how to respond. Idea, evidence, example. Interesting. Okay, I don't really use that, but we can, we can try use this. Okay, does anyone else have any other strategies on how to give argumentation? Or what are the elements of an argument? Point evidence, okay. Example link. Why is your link at the bottom? Link should be 
Link and evidence should technically be the same thing. Analysis, okay, it's true, but analysis should be dissected more. Analysis is a very general term to use. But okay, I see a trend here and I agree with it. Okay, I'm gonna tweak it a little bit. Um, the way I would have it is that I think point and idea are generally the same thing, right? That means you have your, basically your point, right? What do you wanna title your argumentation? For example, um, I don't know, our site will create better discourse, right? That's too easy, right? Okay, let's say this is your argument. The reason you have evidence, the reason you have the link, the reason you have all of this, also example, example is just to, I guess, persuade, but it doesn't necessarily prove a truth it's not an example is not a reason as to why something is true maybe if you use the examples to create a trend like for example it's happened here it's happened here it's happened here therefore it is likely to happen again in this circumstance then that's using it as a link or using it as a form of analysis but to just give full evidence and reasonings and then adding on an example often that example now exists just as a persuasion tool so people can visualize what you say better and people are going to believe you a lot better. Um, but yeah, so this part, the one that I picked, um, I would call it the why is it true part. You're explaining to the judge, why is it true that we will get discourse? For example, this house as the feminist movement will do something will do something or like some form of activism, blah, 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 right? Will we'll engage with male allies. I don't know, right? We'll engage with male allies. That's an example. Let's say my argument is created by the discourse. I have to prove why when I engage with male allies, it will then create better discourse. This is the point of evidence of link of whatever you want to call it, analysis of whatever, right? Reasonings. You basically have to tell the judge, why is it true that this will lead to this? And I'll draw something for you to make it make sense later. The second thing is that you cannot assume that better discourse is a good thing. Let's say you've proven, okay, it's true, we get better discourse. But opt can easily go, yeah, you get better discourse, but better discourse is bad. The more people in the conversation, the more, like, I guess, corrupt the conversation will become, the more pointless and meaningless the conversation become. If we invite male men into feminist discussions, they'll make it their own. They'll all these negative things. So who's to say better discourse is a good thing? So the second thing you have to do is explain why is it good or bad, depending, of course, if you want better discourse to be good, prove why it's good. If you want better discourse to be bad, then prove why it's bad, right? Or like, for example, let's say your argument is, I don't know, it um, reduces, uh, I don't know, abuse. Okay, so you wanna explain why abuse is bad, okay? Obviously abuse is bad, that's a bad example, but you get what I mean, right? Uh, it's trying to say that an outcome can either be good or bad, don't take it for granted and explain, oh, better discourse is good because why? Oh, it's good because more people get to know, awareness, more ability for political change, whatever, doesn't matter, right? And third is to explain why is it relevant or important. I think the word relevant is more relevant, to be honest, because if important is going to be very similar to why is it good or bad. Of course, um, create better discourse. It's good because you're going to insert why it's important or oh, because of awareness, political change, whatever. So I think relevant is the more accurate way. Relevant meaning why is it relevant to the debate? What does it solve? Does it solve um, or the problem of women this whole time has been really getting a hard time getting political changes because they don't have support from allies because they're not strong enough as a movement whatever it is it's relevant because it solves the fundamental problem in the debate or it's relevant because the debate asks you to explain what is best for the feminist movement's awareness whatever right 
So basically, this one is a bit meta. What I mean by meta is simply it's a little bit more explaining why it's relevant to the debate as opposed to relevant to the feminist movement. Obviously, what's relevant to the debate is what's relevant to the feminist movement. But you get what I mean, right? You're not just your debate. You're sort of arguing as though you are the judge and you're explaining why this argument is necessary for the game of the debate. So these are like the three fundamental things. Um, examples can be inserted anywhere in this, right? So that's sort of the three general questions you ask for an argumentation. If you want to visualize it as a storyline, it should look something like this. This is the words of the motion argument. Okay? The reason I'm teaching you argumentations a little bit first is because in order for you to rebut, it's basically how to deconstruct an argument. So for you to deconstruct an argument, you have to learn how to construct an argument first. Um, but note that, of course, not every speaker is structured. Not all of them will follow this exact thing. So you must listen properly and try to detect, are they trying to explain the why is it true part? Are they trying to explain the why is it good, why is it bad part? Or are they trying to explain the why is it relevant part, right? So, and then your responses will make ultimate more sense. So I'm trying to tell you that a lot of people might not use this, but it's your task to take what they say and make good use of it. Okay, so basically to put it in sort of like a picture or like a, I guess, more of a visual, this is the motion. The motion usually asks you to defend something. So you have a stance. In this particular scenario, the stance is engage with male allies, right? Engage with male allies. And you are saying that, hey, we can reach this benefit of better discourse or more discourse, whatever. Okay, so the first step is to always link this to this. Link it. And whatever questions is necessary to link it, answer those questions. For example, some questions you might ask are, how will the male allies respond? Of course, the male allies have to respond well in order to get better discourse. So answer that. B, um, what will outreach look like? How many, what demographic will listen to us? What will be the content of the discussion? All of these things have to be answered in order to go from point X to point the other point X, basically, right? So that's the importance of link. So when you say evidence analysis, analysis have to come in packets, little packets, little questions that you answer, which will overall answer the question of, how does engaging with male allies get you discourse? So this is the link, this is the bridge. This is the, why is it true? Okay, it's true because, okay, this amount of people, so that's sort of how you break down your arguments. And once you get your conclusion, you can extend it a little bit more to reach point Y, see? And now, so basically the story is, how do you get from the motion? Because nothing beyond the words of the motion can be believed as true unless you prove it, right? So if the motion just says feminists will engage with male allies, the only thing that isn't an assertion is that feminists can engage with male allies. Beyond that, male allies responding well, they get this benefit, this course here, whatever, all of this you have to prove the truth of through analysis like we mentioned just now, or else it's all simply just an assertion. Like if you come up here and say that, oh, if we engage with male allies, duh, we get better discourse. Now that's an assertion. I need reasons why, right? So how do you know from what point to what point? From the point of the word of the motion, engage with male allies, if it's banned smoking, from banning smoking up until healthier people, every little story plot line you have to fill in. Right, so that's what link looks like. Okay, and now you get better discourse. Now extend it further and tell me the benefits. So you want to say political change, whatever, whatever, whatever. So that's point Y, the impacts, the benefits. Why is it good? Why is it bad? Kind of thing. So this is B, and the meta part, I guess, is just an overall thing as to why this whole packet is relevant in the debate in particular. Right. 
Um, why is every element of this important? Why is it true? Of course, it's important because like I said, if you don't prove something to be true, it's merely an assertion. Why is it good? Why is it bad? Is because you cannot assume that an outcome is good or bad. You have to associate it with some impact. Also, it strengthens your argument. From this tiny better discourse thing, you were able to, um, how do I say, kembangkan or expand the argument to three separate impacts, which is how you strengthen your argumentation. That's why the B part is good. And C is important because if you don't tell me why it's relevant and you prove all these benefits, and I'm like, I mean, that's not part of the debate. The debate asks about... Um, for example, I mean, this particular argument makes sense for this motion. But if we talk about this house as the feminist movement will engage with male allies, and you say the benefit is that men will now feel included. Who cares about men, right? It's not relevant to the debate. The debate is about as feminists. We want benefits to feminist movements. So who cares about these male random people that voice out about feminism? So maybe you make whole sense of the argument and this impacts and all. But again, if you don't fulfill C, it's like, who cares? Someone else can do a good argument and they'll easily win because, again, no one really thinks your argument is positioned as important or relevant to the debate. Okay, so far, any questions on building argumentation? Question one, question two, question three. Okay, cool. So now that we know how to build an argument, we will know how to destroy an argument, which is a rebuttal. And it's pretty simple. Firstly, you have to explain why it's not true. So whatever analysis that they give us now, reverse it and say why it's not true. And I'll teach you how to do that later. B, you have to say, if they say why it's good, you have to explain why it's bad. And if they say why it's bad, you have to explain why it's good. So opposite lah. And thirdly, why it's irrelevant. Okay. So now let's see what it looks like when you apply it, right? Layers of rebuttals. Okay, cool. So why is it untrue? Now, when someone proves, sometimes, let's say in this particular scenario, they say engaging with male allies can lead to better discourse. Sometimes, sometimes, you don't actually have to go in depth to all the things that they argued here. If someone says, and this is the sentence, okay, Male allies, engaging with male allies can lead to better discourse. And they give me reasons why, lah, A, B, C, whatever. The response that you have to prove, remember, responses also have, you have a burden to prove something when you respond. So don't just try to say, no, they're wrong because they sneezed in the middle of the analysis. Don't say that, right? So when someone says engaging with male allies can lead to better discourse, you have to prove why engaging with male allies does not lead to better discourse. So easy, you just have to flip the sentence. Reason one, reason two, reason three, okay? Does not lead. Or you can say, why engaging with male allies leads to worse discourse. Same thing. So I'm going to try now. Let's say on government, my argument is that um, whatever motion it is, my argument is that the economy will become stronger. Become stronger. So what will your response title be? Can someone tell me?
Can someone tell me what the sort of opposite of the sentence is? Exactly, the economy will not become stronger. So easy, right? Exactly. And then you have to prove it, obviously, and we'll talk about it later. Correct. So if I say that um, banning smoking uh, will create a healthier society, what's the response? The argument is banning smoking will create a healthier society. How do I prove it's not true? I have to answer the question of, yes, banning smoking will not, so easy, you got the point. Now, why is this easier said than done? Because in debating, especially if you're a novice, people rarely conclude their arguments, right? And they rarely have this neat little title where it's very clear. Sometimes their title is here, this course, suddenly they are, they are their conclusion is something completely different. You don't want that, right? So what you want to do when you respond, and this is the tricky part, is to listen carefully at what their conclusion is. If their conclusion, if they say, oh, this, that, blah, 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 but you comprehend the conclusion is, oh, they're trying to prove why the economy is weaker. So what you respond to is that conclusion, right? So it's easy now because I'm just flipping the sentence for you. But at times, people might not be as explicit with their conclusion. So you must really listen and try to not only write down verbatim, but comprehend what are they trying to prove. And use, unless, uh, if they're messy, lah, if they already have a clear idea of what they're trying to prove, then take what they said. But more often than not, people don't have that. So try to comprehend what they're trying to conclude and flip it into a, into a sentence. So that's part one of why is it true. Why is it untrue, sorry. So the second layer, not means, the second layer is to have an even if. All of this is an even if. Even if means that first, I try to prove why it's untrue. I'll prove that engaging with male allies leads to worse discourse because it um, oversaturates um, discourse. Discourse means discussion for those that don't know. So it oversaturates discourse or it removes attention from um, oppressed minorities, which are, I guess, gender minorities, right? Um, also engaging with male allies does not lead to better discourse because it forces you to compromise your values, for example. Okay, so I have three strong reasons as to why it's untrue. But who knows, maybe my three reasons don't actually make sense to the judge, maybe it's not strong enough. That's why I have my second layer, which is even if. So even if assumes that the previous part is a failed attempt at responding. So I go judge, this argument is untrue for a few reasons. Number one, number two, number three. But even if it is true that you can lead to better discourse. So you sort of, assume that, fine, let's agree to them and it is true. You sort of assume that your um, rebuttal sort of failed, even though obviously it's layered. So it adds up to one over the other and it makes your response stronger and it diminishes their arguments more. So you go, even if it's not true, yeah, uh, sorry, even if it's true that it can lead to better discourse, it's actually a bad thing to lead to, okay, not better, lah, more, the same more discourse. Um, is actually bad because why? They were trying to say that more discourse is good. So you do the opposite. You say why discourse is bad. So the second part is even if it's true, more discourse, it is actually, and by the way, you don't have to do all of these layers, right? You have to be strategic um, in which layers you want to um, take on or not, right? All right, so... Okay, so even if uh, it's true that you will get this course, why is it actually a bad thing? It's bad because, like I said just now, it's sort of optional. If you notice, now it's sort of similar. It's going to be the similar answer. In that case, if there's no new material, don't just repeat. Um, just let it go. Let this one go. Um, but you can always brainstorm ideas and sort of use this opportunity to force yourself to think. So... Any ideas? Even if it's true that it will lead to more discourse, why is it a bad thing? 
maybe you can say that um, more discourse corrupts the conversation, the conversation. Or maybe you can say more discourse creates larger controversies, which is bad, right? Maybe you can say more discourse, um, too many opinions causes conflicts, exactly, right? Um, conflicts amongst the society, uh, amongst the feminist movement. So many things you can argue. Um, so this is why it's bad. Um, so that's the second layer. And the final layer assumes that the second layer failed. So if you're trying to prove why it's bad, this, why it's bad, that, the third layer is even if your, even if better discourse is in fact good, even if better discourse is in fact good, why is it irrelevant? Um, you have to argue why this whole argument is irrelevant. Um, and again, it's optional. If you do think that it is a relevant argumentation, don't respond with this thing. And this where you have to not just use template, but also try to rationalize. And you can say, why is it irrelevant? A, because the burden of the debate, meaning what is supposed to be discussed in the debate, um, is about policy changes. Therefore, irregardless of whether or not discourse is more or less, it doesn't affect um, the true change that is needed, which is policy changes, for example. Or another example is, um, this is irrelevant, discourse is irrelevant because with or without male allies, discourse on feminism is always high anyways, right? So even without engaging with male allies, discourse is already high. Everyone's talking about the feminist movement. It doesn't really make a difference. Therefore, it's irrelevant. Is there a layer where you reprioritize? Reprioritize what with what? Mm, Sean, you can, um, I need to clarify. Uh, hello, hello. Hello. Like, yes. you know, like we're talking about discourse right now. You kind of just said it like it's irrelevant. Like, but then like what I'm saying, trying to say is like, we do not uh, like, uh, what is the motion? Sorry. Uh, I kinda... Let's assume it's engage. This house as the feminist movement will engage with male allies. Uh, then you can say like reprioritizing as in like uh, the discourse doesn't like we said discourse is bad but then we just reprioritize like if let's say we can prove that discourse is bad in some way we just reprioritize and saying that there's other important issues like there are other reasons why they are, it's more severe that to engage with the uh, male allies like doing a trade-off or biting the bullet essentially Okay, you're using too many debate jargons, uh, biting the bullet, using the trade-off, um, which I don't think is intuitive usage right now. I think what you mean is basically to argue like there are worse things at hand. Is that what you mean? Yeah, kind of. Um, it depends on what you're comparing with, right? So when you say prioritize, obviously you're trying to prioritize it over something. So is that other something your argument or is it their argument? Like, what are you trying to prioritize it over? If it is your argument versus their argument, then you might want to do it in your framing part and not really a response part, right? Um, maybe you can sort of do it here as well. It's irrelevant because um, we have argued about X, Y, Z, or we frame the debate to be that, um, I don't know, like, like I said just now, right? This policy changes thing. For example, your argument is about policy changes. Your, uh, you already frame policy changes as the most important thing. So the way you wanna prove it's irrelevant is to prove that this debate is about policy changes. And of course you frame it already just now. And of course your argument has something to do with policy changes. And therefore you're trying to say, oh, we've built up this problem that the problem is in fact policy changes. And because they're not debating on this grounds, it becomes irrelevant. So irrelevant isn't just saying that, oh, it's irrelevant. You have to put in the work as well and frame it. Um, but I think to frame it all here is a bit much. Usually people frame it at like their case setup part of the debate, um, which then makes it easier to respond lower down. So yes, you can reprioritize at this part, but the heavy work of, um, the reprioritization happens in your case setup part. Uh, 
Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Okay, so, all right. So basically that's it. That's responses sorted. Again, a lot of it has, uh, or is very reliant on very good listening. Um, and also, if for instance, uh, very good listening and also very good comprehension of the other's team. Miss Hana, if for instance, the banning smoking debate, right? And the argument is about health and it's too hard to prove that it's irrelevant. Should we still do that part? No, we shouldn't. Um, because we're fighting a losing battle, right? Of course, it's relevant. So you try to really push on the why is it untrue part. And that's why this is the first layer, right? If you did the first layer so impeccable, you think you've destroyed their argument, that's it. Leave the other two, right? Obviously, like, um, it's hard to prove that better health is bad, right? And obviously, health is relevant when it comes to smoking debate. So then focus on the first part. Um, that's why I think the first part is the most important part. And uh, the first part is also the part where a lot of people don't do correct. Intuitively, a lot of people end up doing this. So they go, oh, yours is untrue because, and then insert your own argument. That's not a response. A response cannot just keep on coming back to your argument. You're wrong because I'm right. No, they're wrong because they're wrong. Give new reasons as to why they're wrong. If you always come back to your arguments, that's like you're not actually listening to them. And that's why sometimes you get feedback like you're not engaging. And you're like, yeah, we did. We responded. What? Well, you have to really look into how you've been responding. Have you been really giving credit to them for their conclusions? Have you really responded and give justice to their argument? Or have you just been using that opportunity to bring back your arguments? So that's sort of what you want to watch out for. Okay, so um, that's in terms of um, responses. Does anyone want to volunteer and give one argument? I'll give you a motion. Someone does one argument. Just one person, just one argument, like two minutes max. Any volunteers? Okay, no volunteers. Let's have a practice. Um, I, I want to kind of want to volunteer. Um, I'll wait, I'll wait, no worries. I'll give the motion first. What I want is not even a framing, opening line, no don't need all of that. I just want one argument. Oh, I forgot to add one thing. Responses, why is it untrue, all that stuff. It's not just for argumentation. You can resp respond to anything. If you think that their context is a bit biased, feel free to go. Um, this is not what the context actually looks like. Here's a better representation of it than give your part. Um, if you feel like they are burden, they're pushing unreasonable burdens to you, you can respond to that. But like in technical terms, um, this is what rebuttals should look like. Lah. But don't, don't feel like you can only disagree with them uh, in argumentation. You can disagree in every layer of their speech. This is a WSDC motion from Hello Motions. One dominated by a few large players. Okay, this has prefers a tech industry characterized by multiple smaller firms, for example, an industry with a lot of small companies selling tech products and making new tech innovations, rather than one dominated by a few large players, which is what we have currently, and sort of like an oligopoly where we have Google, Amazon, Facebook, large, large, big tech companies that dominate the whole tech industry. Um, so anyone has any ideas and anyone want to volunteer? Give me one second, let me increase my fan speed. All right, any volunteers? Okay, there are no volunteers. So what I'm going to do is we can just discuss an argumentation, right? Okay, so any ideas of what a Gov argument would look like? Any 
Anyone? You can type in the chat. More companies equals to greater. No, nobody. Okay, cool. So basically, the most basic argument is that push for the decentralizing influence. Decent, would it push for the benefit decentralizing influence has on smaller companies? What does decentralizing influence mean? Is it more effective for country's economy? Very vague. It can be run in any motion. We want a little bit more specificity. More competition. Okay, that's good. More job op options for society. Yep, that's good. So country's economy is very wide. Competition and more job opportunities are a good way to specify this good economy argument, right? And for the decentralized influence, um, I'm a bit unclear of whose influence on who. Um, is it the tech industry's influence on people or is it the government's influence on tech? Um, it has to be clarified, right? More opportunities. Okay, so basically just increase opportunity, right? You don't have to worry about using jargon, right? You can just say increase opportunities for tech industries. Okay, more variety for certain stuff. Great, so basically increase competition, right? Increase competition. So what this looks like is more variety in pro more variety in what is it in products or um and the place you might think it great so by establishing a smaller shop that we're really done with. okay so you can yeah we can talk about that also about um with greater paychecks uh job opportunities better jobs basically but that's the second argument we can talk about this one first right competition so variety in products, et cetera, et cetera. Right, as usual, the first layer is why is it true? So why is it true will be denoted um, by explaining, remember the words of the motion is multiple smaller firms. You have to tell me the story of how multiple smaller firms leads to higher competition. Okay, anyone has reasonings? Why does multiple smaller firms lead to higher competition? Maybe you can say reduce the barrier to entry. That means it's easier for you to enter the market if it's not dom dominated by a few large companies. Um, aside from that, you can also argue that competition, less manipulation, domination of the market. Um, why does manipulation lead to, why does domination uh, equate to manipulation? That's my question. Why is it that with fewer companies, it leads to manipulation? Okay, so now we're looking for reasonings as to why multiple small firms lead to higher competition. Any ideas? Smaller firms, the resources to influence tech. Uh, okay, one second, let me look at this. Give smaller firms the resources to influence trends. Uh, why, why, where do they get these resources from? Okay, so give smaller firms the resources. What do you mean give smaller firms the resources? Because they're not given resources by anyone. Uh, it's sort of their own resource and they sort of started it to influence the trends of tech industry. But how does that prove higher, comp uh, higher competition? I want this story. How does smaller firms lead to higher competition? Why is it with smaller firms to get higher competition? People need to up their game in order to get attention because there are more friends. Um, yeah, I guess, um, how do we say that? Eh? People need to basically just, um, but that's sort of the conclusion already, right? Like higher competition, that's the whole point that like people up their game. The conclusion is they up their game. 
with the eliminated barrier, there is an opportunity where startups will push to grow. Okay, sure. I guess increase startup. I guess it's correlated, but it can be a second reasoning. Um, if companies don't put out good products, they will fail. This is more of an outcome of high competition as opposed to why I want this part. Right? I want the story of how this leads to this. Not necessarily what competition looks like, but rather why multiple smaller firms leads to competition. It's a very small distinction, I know, but uh, if you notice, like for example, if companies don't put out good products, they will fail. Um, it's more of an, an illustration of what competition looks like as opposed to a reason as to why we get competition. Since then, the, since then, the smaller firms have more chances to be able to go against each other rather than one powerful firm. Again, a description of competition. Uh, big companies can't afford to fail. Um, yep, we can see that. Um, a higher risk of failing. Of failing, I guess. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's okay. Uh, but, but we have to refine these ideas a little bit more, but these are um, good reasonings uh, because then more companies can compete with the, compete with the either they are similar ideas or very different ideas. More companies can compete with either they are similar ideas or very different ideas. I'm not quite sure what this means. I'm so sorry. Um, so they are incentivized to compete. All right. Customers have a lot of substitutes. Um, yep. Yeah. Companies have a lot of substitutes is uh, a, a good one. I like it. Um, that's a good reason. Companies have more product substitutes, meaning that like the reason high competition exists is because with a lot of firms, obviously there's more products and therefore companies, um, therefore like um, as a buyer, I can buy from company A, company B, company C. So I have a lot of options. Therefore that's why it increased competitions. Product options or substitutes. Smaller companies are motivated to do better since there isn't, going a, a go, isn't a go to big tech company. Why? Uh, viewers have more options. So rather than all profit going to one, remember it's not just viewers, it's not social media only, it's a tech in general and people buy tech everywhere. So rather than all profit going to one company, small companies need to try to attract viewers. Um, yeah, I guess that's right. I guess it's very similar to this. Lah. For our companies, um, sorry, consumers, sorry, consumers have more product options. So that's what it means. Okay, very good reasonings. That's why um, teammates are good because you brainstorm and you refine ideas together. But great, we have, why is it true? It's true that you will get to your conclusion because you reduce the barrier to entry, you increase startup culture because there's higher risk, um, there's lower risk of failure, you know, there's higher risk of failure, that's why you can increase competition. Um, and consumers have more product options as substitute, which means that people become more competitive. Very good, okay. So now why is it truly sorted? Is, is increasing competition supposed to be good or bad? If you are government um, and you are defending multiple smaller firms, presumably you would want increased competition to be good because you you already correlated what you're defending, what you're defending, to this high competition. So of course you want high competition to be good. So why is high competition good? Insert some of the ideas that you guys mentioned just now that were not really used. Um, this is when you give me the impacts of high competition more innovative products, cheaper products, any more ideas, products, um, motivation, higher incentive to keep going. Um, why is that a good thing? See, the thing is motivation, higher incentive is that when you talk about economics, tech, it's so concrete. So sometimes when you use words like, oh, a more higher motivation to keep going, it sounds a bit like you're talking about an individual as opposed to a company. So how do you make it sound a little bit more company savvy? Maybe you can talk about, um, I don't know, increased sustainability of businesses, meaning that a business, a business life will last longer. Um, 
something like that, right? Because remember, we're not trying to humanize these companies. But you have to sort of notice the tone of the motion. The motion right now is talking about tech companies, right? So you want to make it sound a bit more corporate, a little bit more, I guess, company, talking about a company, talking about tech. And usually fluffy argumentations like motivation, etc., doesn't really land. So try to find a bit more economic-centric um, vocabulary to describe it. Um, something that Olivia said just now, um, more job opportunities, competition is good because more job opportunities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is when you can tell me the benefits of you know, high competition allows for dynamic industry, maybe allows for more sustainable methods of production versus falling big. Uh, okay, yeah, sure, sustainability. Why? Because dynamic industry. Very good. Okay. And then you can also argue why is it relevant? Obviously, it's relevant because what are we arguing? High competition, right? It's relevant because this debate, this debate has one burden. It seeks to find the best version of the tech industry. Therefore, why is it relevant? Because it answers the best version of the tech industry where it is accessible, blah, 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 right? So basically, you're trying to prove that we answer the burden of motion. Cool, sort it, done. Now, let's flip it and look at the opposition side. If someone says, why is it true? If this is the argumentation, this is how the response should look like, right? This is the full argument. The response should be, you listen, listen, listen to what they say. When you want to give your response, it should sound like this. Um, I'm going to respond to their first argumentation on increasing competition. Why can't smaller um, tech firms increase competition? So this, even answering this, you already will... Even answering this, you've answered the most important thing, which is why is it true? Remember, why is it true is the basis of every argument. So if you can answer this, like forget relevance, forget why is it good, why is it bad, it's already considered sort of destroyed because why is it true is the premise of the argumentation. So tell me, why can't smaller tech firms increase competition? Okay, anyone? Why can't smaller, multiple smaller tech firms increase competition? Um, they can't increase competition because the bigger firms are too famous and are too well known to have a smaller firm. Okay, but remember, the debate is about multiple smaller firms versus a few large players. Multiple smaller firm world, the world that Gov defends, assume there are no large companies. That's the hypothetical. So the hypothetical is Gov defends a bunch of small firms, no large firms, and um, op defends like say three, four, five large firms. So that can't be true because uh, it doesn't acknowledge the op case. Insufficient capital, very good. Insufficient capital to innovate. Or insufficient uh, capital to compete. Right? We want to make it seem as correlated to increasing competition. We don't want to jump to innovation yet. They wouldn't be selling the same things. The product would be too different to compare to and go. They wouldn't be selling the same things and products will be too different to compare and go against each other. What does that mean? Why is it that when products are different, it's harder to go against each other? Isn't it easier to go against each other if they're different? Um, because obviously, right, like, um, the reason we buy new apples again and again is because they are somewhat different. Although very similar, they are different. And each company is trying to become different from each other. So if they're too different, why wouldn't, yeah, I think competition would be easier. Society wouldn't care about the smaller firms and go, go to tech companies against them. Again, um, similar problem. Society wouldn't care about the smaller firms going against the go-to tech companies like Facebook, Gov World assumes that go-to tech companies, large companies, Facebook, Amazon, does not exist. So be very clear of what Gov is defending. It assumes it's not status quo. Opposition defends status quo. Gov does not defend status quo. Even though 
you are opposition responding to government, we cannot assume um, we cannot assume Gov's ops world. We have to acknowledge Gov's world, a world where there are not a lot of um, uh, where there are where the large tech companies don't exist. Lack of resources, similar lack of resources, insufficient capital. Hard to follow different trends perpetuated by small firms having prominence will make it difficult for new firms to compete. Um, I guess my problem with this one is how do we distinct it from opposition? If it's large firms, it's also hard to follow trends. Why is it exclusive to multiple smaller tech firms? Um, I'm going to flip something that was said just now. Uh, someone said that society would go to their uh, uh, tech firms or someone said that, uh, uh, someone said they wouldn't be selling the same things, their products will be too different. I'm gonna argue that products will be too similar because there's so many people. Products will be too similar, therefore decreases competition, right? So when there are too many companies, no one really innovates. Uh, you see this in all your, Pudong shops that sell the same thing. You see this in when there's a lot of firms, a lot of companies, no one really stands out and no one really has the capital to innovate. So therefore their products will be very similar to each other, therefore less competition. Not having the ability to properly advertise and distribute due to lack of logistics. Uh, yeah, okay. Ability to, but we're talking about competition specifically, but I guess it doesn't really conclude to why it doesn't, um, increase competition. Mm. Alternatively, you can maybe say smaller tech firms are not as profit driven, not as profit driven, so they won't uh, have high competition because obviously when they're smaller, a lot of multiple smaller tech firms, um, they're usually just trying to sell the product just cause and like their profit their hold on profit is not that high. Larger firm would be richer overall and have more manpower, which will probably create better products compared to small firm. Mm. Again, what you're doing is that you are bringing an op argument in, right? You're talking about larger firms. Remember, remember what I said just now about responding? Respond purely on what they have said. And they have only said that multiple companies Increase, comp uh, increase competition. So say why it doesn't. When you start seeing things like, oh, larger firms are richer, or larger firms have more competition, you're bringing in your case. You are not engaging with them yet. So be very wary of that. You can use that, but in comparative, when you build your argument, and then later on in later parts of your argument, you're trying to compare between the two worlds, then you can use that. But when you are responding, you don't want to start bringing your arguments up and trying to bring out, oh, that we're the better team. No, because once you start doing that, you're not properly engaging and listening, right? So you just want to purely talk about this particular sentence. Why can't smaller tech firms increase competition? So if I ask, why can't smaller tech firms increase competition? And you say, um, because larger firms will be richer overall. That doesn't really add up. It, correlate to each other, but it's a few leaps ahead. It's like asking what you want for dinner. Um, breakfast sounds really good. It makes sense, you're not into dinner, but you have to answer the question first. I do not want dinner, something like that, right? So that's sort of why is it true part. So even this is sort of already sufficient, but to further add, you can have the even if, even if uh, increased competition is actually bad, and you can uh, include questions like, for example, you can include answers like competition is bad because um, harder to succeed as a company. Uh, it can also mean that too high of competition essentially leads to, I guess, just homogenous. Everyone's just trying to play it safe, uh, homogenous uh, products, etc. I mean, debatable, but yeah. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. And the why is it relevant? Probably won't argue that because competition is probably very relevant. So this is sort of what your response should look like. Would you say 
profit will be small in the short term since you mentioned small firms are not profit driven or economically influential. Did you say profit will be small in the short term? Why are we talking about profit again? Um, what, what is this, an argument or is it answering something that I asked just now? Profit driven or economically influential. Uh, is it despite the why, why, even if why increasing competition is bad? Am I getting this right, Chloe? Is it this question? Uh, if it's this for this question, yes, that makes sense. Oh, just an argument. Uh, profit will be small in the short term since you mentioned small firms are not profit driven or economically. On opposition, is it? Argument on opposition. Uh, it's okay, not the strongest argument because profit benefits a particular company. And remember what the, the, the motion wants. The motion wants the, uh, the, to answer the question of which is the best version of the tech industry. If you can tell me why profit is the most important thing in the tech industry, then sure. But I don't think profit is. I think uh, it's more of like increased accessibility. Profits lead to these things. But remember, and then your argument wouldn't like, shouldn't really be the profit thing. It should be like increased accessibility or like um, increased research and development. And then your analysis can be uh, more profit allows for these things to happen. Why? Because um, the motion's burden is to evaluate which is the best version of a tech industry and profit doesn't really indicate a good or bad tech industry. So you want something more apparent. I hope that makes sense. Could we say that the handful of companies that succeed from the many small firms will eventually start to dominate the market hence the model of competition will not last? Um, you can say that, but in this debate particularly, you are trying to debate a hypothetical between multiple smaller firms versus large players. So why would you say that? Because once you say that smaller firms will become a few large players and you're defending a few large players, you're basic and you're saying, oh, benefits a few large players, a few large players are so good right now. And then you're saying, oh, multiple smaller firms will end up becoming this. So you're basically just giving them your benefits, right? So it's unstrategic. Um, so you don't want to equate between the two worlds have a very distinct idea between what Gov and Op is defending and try not to mesh them. Because the minute you mesh them, it's really hard to make their case look bad without making yours as well look bad. And it's really hard to make your case look good without accidentally making their case look good. Does that make sense? Uh, Shanan, does that make sense? Hello, Miss Hana, can you hear me? Yes. Does my answer make sense? Uh, yeah, it does make sense. But uh, maybe by saying this argument, it proves that the model that is supported by the government is inherently flawed because it's not sustainable. It ends up with the big companies eventually emerging. Is that a good idea? Um, Mm, not really, because you have to really understand what the debate wants, right? The debate isn't this house would implement or this house will break up big tech, right? So that's an action. So you can criticize that action for being unsustainable. This one is a this house prefers. It asks you to hypothetically visualize a world with two separate tech firms. So when you see that, you break the debate. The debate is trying to visualize which version is the best tech firm. So when you say that, oh, one will basically be unsustainable, therefore you break the ability to compare the two hypotheticals. Does that make sense? Meta-wise, it's unstrategic. And it sort of breaks the spirit of the debate. Does that make sense? Yes, please, I understand, I understand. Yeah, Thank you. so you sort of have to understand also what the debate wants um, and not try and play the game, basically. Um, understand what the edge call wants from the motion and play the game. Um, because if not, it will not be strategic for you. And it probably means you're breaking your burden. Uh, so you're either complicating the debate or running a very unstrategic thing. 
So in this case, it's completely redundant because all you need to do in this debate is weigh out which one is better for the tech industry. You don't really have to prove why um, it's actually going to happen or not going to happen or it will last or it will not last, right? It's not a practical uh, thing. It's meant to be hypothetical, right? Okay, so any other questions on responses before I touch slightly on WIP and then I'll end the session. Any other questions? Okay, perfect. Now, so um, responses is a tool used by everyone uh, that is not the prime minister because the prime minister goes first. Um, but everyone who has a speaker before them uh, will respond. The LO will respond, everyone will respond. But what WIP in particular, they cannot have new argumentation, okay? If they do, then they will be penalized or it will not be taken into consideration. So the WIP basically has to uh, wrap up the debate. They are the last speaker. If it's British parliamentary, they are positioned in the closing half. And if it's Asian parliamentary, they're basically the last full speaker. Um, and basically the thing about the WIP is that they're not allowed to give new argumentations, but at the same time, they have to add value to the debate. How do you add value when you can't have argumentation? And this is when responses are very important. The first thing you know is that generally the structure of a whip should be in terms of clashes. How do you find a clash? Disregard rebuttals for a while. Let's assume government runs discourse, government runs, um, I don't know, protection of women. I don't know what motion this is, but I'm just making arguments up. And then they also run sustainability of the movement meaning the longevity of the movement. Up on the other hand argues that, um, let's say Tula, the allyship with men thing, right? Allyship with men. Um, up on the other hand says, okay, you cannot because then it will, let's say they say corrupt discourse. Mm, it will also uh, disable policy changes. changes and no justice for women. I don't know. So between these argumentations, the point of clashes is to find which arguments clash with each other. Again, the hard part isn't doing this mix and match thing. The hard part is listening to what the government says and identifying um, which points are actually considered um, their conclusions or their arguments, right? You don't want to be petty and argue on examples like, oh, this example is not right because it happened in 2020, not 2019. You don't want to do that, right? That's super petty and redundant. Um, you want to identify their conclusions, right? Examples are just to support. Uh, often they're not even reasonings. They're just to help visualize. So examples are the pettiest thing to respond to. Um, but yeah, the point is to understand what their conclusions are. That's the first step. So this assumes that these are the arguments, right? So we skip the first steps. So when you see discourse, which uh, is there anything that operand that can be a clash? Where do I pair this argumentation with? This is like, yeah, corrupt discourse. So this is paired with this. So my first clash will be labeled as a question, open-ended question that can go either way. So my first clash would be, um, what will happen to discourse? What will happen to discourse with male allyship? If I am on guard, I will explain to you why discourse will, I will basically, and what do I say in the inside? I'll say, Gov said this, Op said this, this is why op is bad. This is why gov is good. Therefore, clear conclusion. Therefore, discourse is good and whatever, blah, blah, blah. So you sort of recap with additional responses as well. So you use this opportunity to further um, rebut on opposition's arguments because rebuttals, like I said, many layers, many new ideas. Just now we had so many ideas for one single question. So on a whip, you want to add on the layers of responses and conclude why you won the clash. 
But of course, if you're an op, you have to prove the conclusion should be why this course will be corrupted. Therefore, you won the clash. Okay, the next thing, protection of women. Is there anything that matches here or no? Is there any point on op that matches the protection of women argument? No. Okay. Anyone else have any other opinions? Nope is fair. But the thing is to make it as clean as possible. So yeah, depending on what the content is, this can also be matched. And then the tagline, the title should be, um, which world is more favorable for women? Maybe you use the word favorable so that both can be under the umbrella for women. They say they protect, we argue, obviously, okay, let's assume we're on op, they say protect, we say no, you don't protect, we get justice because blah, blah, blah. Therefore, justice for women under the, our world, we win the clash. And if you're on gov, obviously, you do the other way around. Lah. Um, but let's say you are Yvonne and you don't think there's anything that matches, then feel free to make it independent. We'll talk about that later. Um, and sustainability of the, um, what is this, of the movement. Is there anything that matches? Okay, no, the answer is no, because, I mean, you can, but it's very bit far-fetched. So what you want to do is probably just do two more clashes, which is um, sustainability of the movement. And then this one, uh, policy changes. Who gets better? Who gets policy changes? So what do you, because obviously we're comparing, right? Gov said this, upset this, fight, fight, fight. Gov said this, upset this, fight, fight, fight. Therefore we win. What do you put in here? Obviously, even if Gov didn't make an, even if Op didn't make an argument on sustainability, obviously, let's say PM ran it, LO probably responded to it. So what you want to do is say, Gov said this, uh, op responded with this and then you say um, this is the reason why op's arguments are bad and gov stronger blah blah therefore sustainable if you are on gov lah. if you're on op you can just say um, we responded to this and this response killed your argumentation therefore we win this argument it's no longer sustainable um, and then finally uh, policy changes uh, who gets better policy changes so basically what you want to do uh, in this part of the argumentation or this clash is to basically do the same thing. Uh, upset this, Gov responded with this. This is why Gov response is bad. Therefore, uh, we get policy changes on op. Does that make sense? Theoretically? Okay, I think yes. Okay, so basically that's sort of how you whip and that's why response is important because whip cannot have new arguments. You bring back the gist of what the previous speaker said, but your upper hand is that you clean it up and you try to win clash by clash, clash found by similarities in argument or if there's no similarities, you have, um, you have the argument and its response to ping pong in. If there's no response, the easier, right? You say, this is a really good argument, yada, 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 no response from up, therefore we win the clash. Um, and obviously just by virtue of who wins more clashes or um, uh, whatever wins, right? But let's go to um, someone's question on priority, priority just now. This is where the whip comes in handy. Let's say um, this, you won this argument on gov, you won this argument on gov, you lost this argument on Gov and you won, you lost this argument on Gov. When you want to prioritize the arguments, of course, you have to insert why this argument, argument one, clash one, sorry, and clash three is the most relevant to the debate. And therefore, even if you only want two out of the two clashes, because you're like, fine, my, my DPM didn't respond to that, but it's not an argument that matters. Therefore, based on the relevant clashes, we won the debate. Um, so that's how repriorit reprioritizing can also look like. It's very messy, but I think the point is, uh, has come across. Uh, yeah, so any questions about like the, and yeah, any questions on responses or whipping in general? 
very abrupt end. But yeah, any questions? Okay, Yvonne, no questions. Questions one, questions two, questions three. Okay, perfect. I think that sums up all I wanted to say. To conclude, the purpose of this session is to basically understand how responses or what the elements of responding look like and to try and practice responding without bringing back your arguments. It's to stop and listen to what the other team says and engage and directly respond to their primary conclusion. The skill of identifying their conclusions is the main skill you want to try in live debates. Um, and finally, in WIP is the skill and ability to listen to their case, find their conclusions, find your conclusions and match them up together to identify clashes. So these are all things that take a while to get used to. So I hope you, this is something you can practice uh, in the future or also practice in nationals if you are going. Cool. Aside from that, that's all for me. If there are no questions. Oh, okay. Someone has a question. How do you organize your ops argumentation? The way I organize my paper is that I have my case setup paper. I have my argument one paper, A4 by the way, I don't use iPad. Um, argument two paper and, and A4, I will split in two and I will write down the ops argument. Why is it true? Whatever, whatever. And in the minute I hear their conclusion, they say, therefore we will get blah, blah, blah. I immediately write down, I have to explain, let's say it's why uh, we get this course, right? I immediately write down and decide why we why they don't get this course. And then while they're talking about random stuff, I just answer it quickly, A, B, C. And then I listen again. Oh, another conclusion. Okay, so I write down the conclusion. I immediately write down the flip of that. Second response, why blah, 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 A, B, C. And then I listen again for conclusion. And if it's just them rambling, I, no one cares. But if they're giving an important point or conclusion, important analysis, immediately write it down. So I will put my paper in two and that's what it looks like. So when I give my speech, I do this first and then this second. This is assuming I'm a first speaker, by the way. Second, third, fourth. Yep, that's sort of what it looks like. Any other questions? I mean, you can try your own style as well. Maybe you'll find something that suits you better. But that's generally how I do it. Any other questions? Questions one, questions two, questions three. All right, no worries. Thank you everyone for paying attention and joining me for one hour and 15 minutes. Uh, good luck in your future endeavors in debating. That's all for me and I'll hopefully see you guys soon or in nationals if you're going. Bye.